Hello everyone and welcome to Headwise, the video cast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, founder of Migraine Nation, and I have a history of chronic and daily migraine that began at the age of four. I am very happy to be here today with headache specialist Dr. Vincent Martin. Hi Dr. Martin, how are you today? Well, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for being with us again today. Dr. Martin often comes and talks to us about some of our most complicated topics because he does such a great job of explaining them. Dr. Martin is the director of the Headache and Facial Pain Center at the University of Cincinnati, and he is also the president of the National Headache Foundation. Today, we're here to talk about the association between connective tissue disorders like Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and various types of headache. Dr. Martin is a published author in this area, and he has a significant amount of experience with EDS in his clinic, where many people are affected by this syndrome and come to see him because he's been published in this area. So we're going to start today by talking about the fact that there's many types of connective tissue disorders, and 13 of them fall under the classification of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. We're mostly focusing today on hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And when I refer to EDS today in this particular episode, I'm mostly just talking about hypermobile EDS. So let's start by clarifying for our audience why we are focusing on this subtype and whether the other subtypes may also be at increased risk of various types of headache. We're we're focusing on the hypermobile EDS because it's the most common form of EDS in the population. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any genetic markers, so there's no genetic test we can do to diagnose it as opposed to some of the other forms of EDS that actually do have specific genes that have been linked to them. But when you look at all the diseases of connective tissue disease, usually it's a, a problem with collagen, which is the kind of the filler between cells and provides the elasticity of tissues and so forth. So it's either that or that the material called the extracellular matrix, which surrounds the collagen as well. So that's what these disorders are. They're diseases of kind of the connective tissue that, you know, the, the matrix of tissue that surrounds cells in the body. And it causes people to become very hyper hyper flexible, basically. So there's these criteria called the Biden criteria. And I think we maybe the last time we did this podcast, we actually went through those. And actually, I'm hypermobile myself. I'm, I may not have hypermobile EDS, but I, I'm, I'm definitely hypermobile. So it's a series of tests. So basically what you do is you kind of bend your, your hand forward like this and see if you can touch your, you know, your thumb to your forearm. So it's like forming a swan with your mm-hmm. hand. And then you take your fifth finger and you can see if you can hyperextend it more than 90 degrees. And I can do that too. Mm-hmm. And that gets one point each. And then you bend your arm back and you see if you can see mine kind of bends back like this and it needs to be more than about 190 degrees. And then you do the same thing with the knees. You ask them to lock their knees and if they kind of bow backwards. And then finally, with their knees straight, you ask to see if they can palm the floor. And when each side gets one point, so there's nine points. And when you start getting, depending on the the age of people, usually somewhere between four and, and six criteria, depending on what age will meet the criteria for hypermobility. Okay. So you brought up something that's very interesting that I think sometimes is confusing for people. You can be hypermobile without having EDS, correct? EDS EDS is a diagnosis so it requires a number of different things. In some cases, like one of the criteria is whether you have family members, for example, Mm -hmm. that have have this disorder and that they can they measure your wingspan. There's all these other parameters. And in, in 2017, they kind of changed the criteria. Before that, the criteria were very easy to diagnose someone with EDS, but now you almost need to be in a genetics clinic to be able to diagnose someone with, with EDS formally. But there are many people that are hypermobile, but they don't meet all the formal criteria of hypermobile EDS. So there's a spectrum. So I probably fall somewhere on the spectrum. I probably don't have all the criteria for EDS but I'm definitely hypermobile. So I have, I have some of the features of EDS, but not all of them. Same. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to repeat yourself a little bit in this next question, but I think it's extremely important because I actually hear physicians mess this up all the time. That's how much misinformation is out there. So is EDS a clinical diagnosis or do you have to have genetic testing done in order to be diagnosed? It sounds like in some cases, you can't even 
have genetic testing done. Is that true? Well, it, you know, it depends on what, if you have other forms of EDS, like if you have like, there's one uh, kind of EDS called vascular EDS where you can get like heart attacks and strokes and aneurysms. Mm -hmm. That's kind of suspected in a different clinical situation than just somebody that's hypermobile, but they're also hypermobile as well. There is a genetic test for that. Mm -hmm. And there's some other forms of EDS where the skin, there's like hyper elasticity of the skin where you can kind of pull the skin up that, you know, up like maybe three, three centimeters. Mm -hmm. And there are genetic tests, you know, for that particular form of VDS as well. So there are genetic tests for some forms, some of the rarer forms of EDS, but for the most common form, not. So typically speaking, if you're just hypermobile and you don't have any vascular disease, disease and you don't have, you know, skin elasticity, then genetic testing, frankly, is not very helpful. Okay. So does everyone with EDS experience severe and or chronic headaches? Uh, no. But probably many, many of them do, okay. and there are a variety of different reasons for that. For one, um, we did a study back probably about my goodness, it must be almost ten years ago, hard to believe, where we actually looked at EDS patients in an EDS clinic. Mm -hmm. We compared them versus versus an age and sex match group in a primary care practice, and we found that migraine was more common in the EDS group. And that when it did exist, the headaches were more frequent and more disabling in the group that had EDS. So there probably are reasons for that that we don't quite understand, but it is possible that EDS could affect the peripheral nerves, like the trigeminal nerve itself, because there are certain kinds of neuropathy, neuropathy that are associated with EDS. It's also possible that it causes something called dysautonomia, which is where your autonomic nervous system doesn't quite function right. The autonomic nervous system is your fight or flight nervous system. So, you know, like if you're in a dangerous situation and you need to get out of that situation, you activate your sympathetic nervous system and your heart rate goes up and you're, you're much more vigilant uh, about the environment and maybe your strength improves. But there's, and then there's another one called the parasympathetic. These kind of get out of balance in peace and people with EDS. So, the dysautonomia could could lead to it, or it could be many of the other headache, uh, uh, non-headache syndromes that might actually mod moderate migraine, like the fact that many EDS patients have neck pain because mm -hmm. of the ability of the neck and hypermobility of the spine in particular, mm -hmm. and and sometimes the TMJ joints are are more lax, so they're actually able to, you know, to uh, um, actually open their mouths much wider than other people so they can develop arthritis in their TMJ joints. And there's a variety of other conditions that cause pain in these patients with, you know, with EDS. And they may have fibromyalgia and other pain disorders as well. Okay. So that was going to be my next question. You led right into it. How about other types of pain? We covered migraine as one of the types of headache that may be worse for people with EDS. What about other types of body pain, whether it be fibromyalgia or anything else, what what do they experience in that area? Well, fibromyalgia would be one. That's basically mm -hmm. where you have pain in multiple areas of, of your body. But there, but you can get increased risk of herniated herniating discs in your neck. And that probably that's because the ligaments that connect the two vertebrae are more lax. So there's probably more play of one vertebra, vertebrae on another. So it, ca it can cause herniations in the neck and the cervical region and the neck region or in the lower back. So you can get, you know, they, that can compress nerves. Okay. And also if there's more play of the spine, they, you can get arthritis in those joints that connect the two, the two spines. It's called facet disease. That's very, very common in, in patients with EDS. So, so if your head hurts when you bend backwards and the pain is you know directly over your spine, that could indicate that you have a facet disease. Okay. Um, along with that, there's something called craniocervical instability where sometimes the, the cervical vertebrae up in the neck basically can move in certain ways where it kind of kinks, you know, the, the spine and, and brainstem, and uh, it, it, that can occur. So there can be neck pain, there can be low back pain, there can be fibromyalgia. We mentioned the TMJ issue as well. So patients with EDS, are, are, you rarely have one location of pain in one place. It's usually in multiple places because of this disease that affects your entire body. Okay. Um, let's move on to one of the more common types of headaches 
we hear about in people with EDS in addition to migraine. Let's talk about low pressure and high pressure headache, which are both related to cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid that flows in and around the brain and the spinal cord. Do people with EDS experience these types of headaches more often on average? And why is that? Well, there, there's two different types of headaches in that regard. So there's the low pressure headaches. And those are the ones where you get a headache when you go from a lying to a standing position. Mm -hmm. And also lying down actually helps the pain. And usually what happens is people may need to lie down for, you know, a bit of time before the, the, the headache may either go away or significantly improve. Some people say it may even take lying down overnight for six to eight hours of sleep before that the headache may go away. Mm -hmm. So it's headache on standing up. And then the opposite type of headache is called intracranial hypertension, which is where the spinal fluid pressures are high as opposed to low with the other disorder. And in that, that case, they'll develop headaches when they lean forward, when they cough, bear down, or sneeze, when they exercise. Usually these types of headaches tend to be worse with weather changes, particularly low pressure systems rolling in. So right before rain, often mm -hmm. report headaches and they get something called pulsatile tinnitus where they get ringing in the ear where it, it, it's pulsating. And uh, that can be seen with high pressure headaches. And what's interesting is in these patients with EDS, they may have both in the same person. In, in, in other situations uh, with patients, it's usually one or the other, but it makes you wonder whether this lacks connective tissue that is the lining around the spinal cord. It, that's what keeps the spinal fluid in, you know, in one place surrounding the spinal cord. You wonder if that's not in some ways leading to situations where they have high pressure and low pressure headaches. Okay. My next question was going to be if if they can get, if someone with EDS can get more than one of these types of headaches at once. So you answered that, that they could have both low and high pressure. Can they also have migraine with yeah. all of that? Okay. Yeah. I think one thing, I don't know if I mentioned this in the past podcast or not, but taking care of an EDS patient is almost like, it's like peeling an onion. You say, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. What that means is that there's multiple layers that need to be peeled off before you can actually have a you know really good response. So if you've got migraines and then you've got, you know, a really hypermobile neck or maybe some disc herniations or facet disease, a lot of times that will refer pain up into the back of the head, sometimes up to the top of the head. And that in itself could make migraines worse. So the same thing would tr be true with if you're real hypermobile and you hyper send your jaw when you when you open your mouth. You might develop arthritis of, of this TMJ joint here, and that may be referred up into the temporal region. So you have to figure out what of these comorbid illnesses that a given patient with EDS may have and peel off each layer. So you might send them for physical therapy on their neck with a, a doctor who's, or a physical therapist who's an expert in EDS, because mm -hmm. there's different kinds of exercises for EDS patients than in, in other patients that don't have EDS. And uh, you might work on that. You might work on, you know, their their TMJ. You might work on, you know, other their fibromyalgia as well. Because in these patients, are just there's just so many different pain disorders that they often have, and you need to peel each one off to really know how you're going to do, as well as combining that with treatment of migraine itself. Because you, I wouldn't ignore migraine therapies if their headaches are primarily migraine light. Right. So so, it's complicated. It's it's complicated, but you have to know what you're doing. Well, I was going to say that from the patient perspective, if you are someone who might have the symptoms of EDS or be hypermobile, and you find that you feel like you relate to more than one type of headache, you might not be crazy. So I, I so that's why I was asking that question. So there are a few types, other types of headache that occur more often in the EDS population, what might those be? We don't necessarily want to go into depth about all of them, but just to make sure that people know that there are some others. Well, one are headaches associated with POTS syndrome. So POTS syndrome is where your heart races basically. And I can usually pick these people out in the office pretty easily because usually their pulse is above a hundred just resting there in the office. Mm -hmm. And then when you stand them up, their heart rate, when you go from a lying position to standing, their heart rate will go up by over 30 beats a minute. And then their blood pressure won't really change very much. 
So that itself, you can make the diagnosis of POTS. Now, POTS has specific headaches that are associated with it. Like for, it's called a coat hanger headache that kind of goes, in, it's in the shoulders and kind of goes up into the back of the head. And sometimes when you treat these people with appropriate therapies, including say a beta blocker, which kind of slows the heart rate down, it's a blood pressure pill. Sometimes that can make a big difference, not only in the POTS symptoms, but the headaches associated with the POTS. So POTS is one. There's also something called mast cell disease, which is your mast cells are your inflammatory cells in your body. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, patients with EDS often have these mast cells, which release a lot of inflammatory chemicals or what we call mediators into the body. Mm -hmm. And that can cause things like skin rashes and hives and asthma and people can flush and they can have something called anaphylactic reactions where they develop a swelling of their mouth with various foods or various medications and so forth. But the mast cell is another one that can be also associated with headaches and also confers with it a great sensitivity to medications. Mm -hmm. So if you've got EDS and you got mast cell, usually your intolerance slash allergy list is anywhere from five to 20 or 30 medications. I think the most I've ever seen was 80 medications. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine if someone has that much hypersensitivity to medications and that, that much sensitivity to medication side effects, it's going to be a real challenge. And I have certain medications I use in that situation versus others. Right. Okay. It's got to be rough to be that sensitive to medications and have that many things you need medications for. Just throwing that out there, that can't be easy. So are there other, well, we kind of went over all the comorbidities and disorders that are likely going along with EDS. Are there any others besides MCAS and POTS that you wanted to cover? Uh, medication overuse. Because patients have so much pain, at least in the headache field, we believe, and it's still a hypothesis, that if you consume too many medications to treat pain, right. that that can actually increase the frequency of headaches. And these patients are usually treating multiple forms of pain, hence they're often on multiple medications. So these headaches that we call medication overuse, in layman's terms, they're called rebound headaches, are probably also more common in patients with EDS as well. Okay. So are there certain medications or treatments that you feel are more likely to be effective in people who have EDS? Well, in, in my experience, there are certain meds that I tend to use. One is I use meds with very low side effect profiles. And if I, it, even if they don't have low side effect profiles, I use microscopic doses to start almost pediatric doses of medications. Okay. So the ones I tend to use, things like if I'm going to use an antidepressant, I'll use either nortriptyline, which has a very low side effect profile. I use a diloxetine as an antidepressant. In the, in the blood pressure category, a lot of these patients run extremely low blood pressures. So if you are going to use blood pressure medications, you have to use microscopic doses. And sometimes I'll use extremely low doses of propranolol, which is a beta blocker and Sometimes that'll slow people's heart rates down if they have POTS. Because yeah. uh, if you think about it, if they're running a pulse of 120 and they're standing, that's like they're running a race when they're just standing. Yeah. Not doing anything. I mean, that you can imagine how fatiguing that could be. Right. And then other medications, a lot of the new med new medications like the G pants, there's one called Nurtec, uh, which is the trade name, you know, or Romagipan is the generic name for that. That's given every other day. And I found that to be very helpful in some patients with uh, EDS. And then sometimes the monoclonal antibodies, which are shots, uh, can be used. And then I've used Botox in this population as well. Right. Okay. Um, so it can be very difficult to get an accurate di diagnosis for just any type of chronic or severe headache, let alone also a connective tissue disorder. If someone in our audience suspects they could have one or both of these, do you have any advice for them, even if, even if they're just trying to find out if they have EDS, uh, let alone a headache issue, where would you recommend they go? Well, first you have to have to see doctors that are ED, what I call EDS savvy, mm -hmm. they have a little bit of experience in that. And usually it requires a multidisciplinary team. Like it's rare that you'll find one doctor that'll treat your POTS and your MCAS and your headaches. So you have to have a headache doctor that's EDS savvy and you have to have your POTS doctor and then you have to have your cell doctor if you have those disorders. 
So it's about finding the right team of people and your physical therapists that actually know how to take care of EDS patients. Okay. So I have noticed that this can be, depending on where you're going and where you are in the country, one of those topics that if you just start talking about it with your physician, you it might not be their favorite topic. Do you have any advice for for people who feel like their doctor doesn't like talking about this if they if they've discovered that they might have this? Do we uh, do they have to switch doctors or do you just get a feel? Don't overwhelm your doctor with every complaint in your body. So pick one or two, right? You know, and and deal with those. If if you go if you hit them with too many different things, then they just completely shut out. Sometimes if you mention the word EDS, they're like, "Gee, I don't know much about that. I don't really know how to help you." But we have like an EDS. We had we had an EDS. We do have an EDS clinic in Cincinnati, where they see EDS patients, and there are some PCPs, for example, that are EDS savvy as well. But they're very, very few and far between, and they're just in very probably more in urban settings. I would guess. Okay. All right. Well, is there anything else that you feel we should tell our audience before we go on this topic? Um, if you have EDS, it sounds overwhelming, but there is help. There are many things that we can do you know, to help you know treat your headaches as well as your other pain disorders. You may need to go on a little bit of a search. And sometimes you can search the internet and there are local EDS groups that have doctors that are EDS friendly. And certainly the one in Cincinnati is a very active group. And, and seek out the doctors that understand your disease. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking to us about this today, Dr. Martin. And thank you, everyone, for joining us on this topic. Please join us again for our next episode of Headwise. Everyone have a great evening. Bye-bye.